Hello there, my name is Jeremy McCandless and welcome to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Today we're starting a new chapter in our journey through the Gospel of Luke, in fact our journey through the whole Bible, and today I'm going to be looking at just the first four verses of Luke chapter 21. And I've called today's talk, How Much Should I Give? I'm going to begin by telling you a little story, a humorous joke if you like, but for those of you around the world, you're going to need to take some of the cultural references I make about the UK and apply them into your own situation. Anyway, here it is. A very worn 20 pence piece met a similarly distressed and worn 100 pound note in the till of an Aldi supermarket. They struck up a conversation. The 100 pound bank note asked the 20 pence coin how long he'd been in circulation. About 20 years, he said. Oh, me too, said the 100 pound note. Where have you been during all those years, asked the 20 pence coin. Well, he said, I don't normally shop in Aldi. Usually I'm used in M&S or Waitro. Anyway, I've had a ball this last year, said the 100 pound note. I've traveled all over the world. I've been to the finest restaurants, the biggest and most plush hotels and casinos, golf clubs. I've also been to the most expensive shops and boutiques and visited all kinds of amusement parks and golf clubs. I've actually been to several sporting events this year. I went to the FA Cup final, the, the Open Golf Championship, and even Wimbledon. In fact, in the last month, I've even traveled to Europe. I visited a very special resort spa in Germany, and have also spent time cruising on cruise ships and visiting top-notch hair salons in both London and Paris. Wow, I've been to concert halls, theatres, opera houses. I've even been to Disney World so many times I've lost count. I think I've done it all. So after bragging about his great travels and his adventures, the 100 pound note then asked the 20 pence piece, well, what about you? What have you been up to this year? Well, the 20 pence piece replied, I've been to the Baptist church this week the Methodist Church last week, the United Reformed Church the week before that, and the Pentecostal Church a couple of times last month. In fact, the more I think about it, I just go round different churches every Sunday, jumping in and out of the basket. At that point, the £100 note interrupted and said, wait a minute, what's a church? Now that sounds like an introduction to a sermon on giving, doesn't it? Maybe it sounds like it's a message that says that you should be giving a hundred pounds instead of 20 pence or whatever the equivalent is in your country. Maybe I'm saying your church ought to be painting a big H on the roof of the church hall so, they, so that the minister or pastor can land his helicopter there in the future. Well, that's not exactly what I'm going to say today because there is a message in the Bible where Jesus commends a woman, someone for giving the equivalent of just a couple of small 20 pence piece coins. Now, perhaps you're thinking, well, that's more like a, this is the kind of sermon I'd like to hear. Well, all I can say is on that is be careful what you wish for. Today, friends, we're going to turn together to Luke chapter 21, where we will see the story of something that happens that throws some very clear light and teaching on this difficult, and yet even some would say controversial, issue of giving. Welcome to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Okay, friends, here we go. We're going to drop straight off and I'll read the text for you. Just four verses from the beginning of Luke chapter 21. And it says, As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put more in than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Okay, that's the passage. Okay, now, the first verse says, Jesus looked up and he sees this rich person putting gifts into the temple treasury and he sees this poor widow put in just two very small copper coins. But we need to stop right there at the beginning for a minute because I want us to look at the very opening phrase of the opening verse in order that we can get a handle to what's going on here. 
the opening phrase of verse 1 gives us this intriguing little detail in that it says Jesus looked up. Now that seemingly simple phrase, that simple action would suggest to be that Jesus had previously been occupied with something else or perhaps was just lost in thought or meditating on something else and then suddenly we see his gaze redirected towards what's actually going on right in front of him. A note it says he looks up and he sees the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury and he also sees this poor widow who puts in just two very small copper coins. So what we would say and would have been a familiar scene in that day, the people making their contributions to the temple treasury. Now to understand the significance of the moment it's essential to grasp the context here. Within the temple courtyard, specifically in the area of the court where women were allowed, there were 13 trumpet-shaped collection boxes where worshippers could place their offerings. Each box was designed for the specific purpose relating to a particular upkeep or service of the temple. The Pharisees, as we know, were one group and they were known for their flashy displays of piety. And writings say they would often make a show of placing their donation by literally tossing the coins in so that they would clang loudly against the metal, signalling to everyone around them their generosity. In contrast to the spectacular wealth of some people, Jesus notices this poor widow and she quietly approaches one of the correction boxes and she's in a markedly different position from those affluent people who are making contributions around her. That's the point being illustrated here. And this is because we are told she's a widow. And as I've said before, in ancient Israel, widows were among the most vulnerable members of that society. They lacked any sense of financial security and they were dependent to a great extent upon the mercy of others. And, but for this woman, putting in two small coins or mites, as they're described in some translations, is seen as a significant act because it would have represented a considerable sacrifice out of her mere meagre resources. Now, before looking any further at this, it's crucial to notice that there is an absence of judgment or condemnation in any of what Jesus observes going on here, certainly in the way Luke describes it anyway. Jesus is not seen to condemn the rich for being rich. Rather, it just offers us a contrast and wants to highlight for us this widow's extraordinarily generous act of faith. Now, considering these points, one might naturally assume that the rich gave more substantial amounts than the widow. After all, their resources would have far exceeded hers. Now, the text doesn't provide any specifics about their contributions. However, there is an underlying assumption here, and it's the critical part of the passage, which I suppose is saying, beware, appearances can be deceiving. Don't judge things and standards by the world's point of view, but by God, God sees things. And then as we move forward in the text to verse 3, we can continue to unravel some of the added insights embedded in this encounter between Jesus and what he witnesses among the worshippers of the temple and what he says about it. And he says this, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more in than all the others. Now, indeed, the teachings of Jesus presented by Luke in this passage is meant to absolutely convey, challenge conventional notions of what should be considered generous generosity of giving. At first glance, it may seem counterintuitive or even nonsensical to suggest that the small offering would be surpassing the larger donations in their significance. However, Jesus provides a spiritual perspective on what's going on here, one that transcends the mere cold, hard arithmetic of it. Jesus flips apparent logic on its head here. And in verse 4, he explains this by saying, All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. These wealthy individuals gave out of their surplus money. They gave their contributions, which of course were numerically significant, but did not represent, and here's the key, a sacrificial amount for them. They gave without any real personal cost or sacrifice involved. But on the other hand, this widow, despite her poverty, gave everything she had, 
and in her case it was two small coins, widow's mites as some call them, representing not just a flat percentage of her income, but her entire surplus of money that she had available to her at that point in time, the entire amount she had in her possession. In essence, it's saying she held nothing back. She offered her entire resources in devotion to God. Now, it's essential to understand here that Jesus is not simply praising the widow's spirit or attitude, although these aspects are undoubtedly praiseworthy and we're not to ignore them either. Rather, he's trying to highlight the sacrificial nature of her gift. She gave not just financially, but with her whole heart and soul. Her offering, in the world's eyes, small and monetary value, carried far greater weight in the eyes of God because of the sacrifice that decision to give represented. And this passage is meant to challenge us head on and to re about rethinking our perspectives on what it really means to give. It urges us to consider not just the numerical amount of any gifts that we give, but how it links to the proportion of the sacrifice it means we're making in our lives. True giving, according to Jesus here, is not ever measured by the size of the donation, but the depth of the commitment and the devotion that lies behind it. When it comes to Jesus, Jesus wants us to give simply generously, proportionally, uh, but the most important one is sacrificially. And as we reflect in this teaching, I think those people today and we still today are meant to examine our own attitude towards giving to the Lord or the work of the Lord. Are we simply to come to him offering our leftovers, the things that we can spare after we've bought everything we wanted to buy this week? Or are we meant to come with a degree of personal sacrifice? Are we willing to follow the example of this widow, offering ourselves entirely to God? Because that, in reality, costs us a lot more than anything financial. The main point I believed here lies in our understanding that this is something that was sacrificial. Look at verse 3. He says, Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more. Nothing is mentioned about her motive. The emphasis is on the amount she gave, not being more numerically, but the fact that it represented a sacrifice. It would have caused her effort and a degree of hardship to give that amount. Now, I think probably when I mention giving and discuss amounts, the first thing that probably pops into a lot of Christians' mind is, is he talking about tithing? Now, to fully address that topic within the biblical framework, I do think we need to address the concept of tithing for a minute, not in any great detail, but simply to say that we find that before the Mosaic law, giving was entirely voluntary. During the period of the law, it became compulsory, amounting to actually about 23 and a third percent annually, with additional love offerings on top. Not in fact the 10 percent that most people think. Now, I don't have time to go into that in detail, but there are occasions where I have and will as we progress uh, through passages that more deal with this issue directly. However, the important point to make is that in the New Testament, we're not under the Mosaic law. Therefore, we are not commanded to tithe, but we are commanded to give generously, proportionally and sacrificially. And that's the limit to it. So I hope you've got that. Now, if you want to know a more detailed discussion of giving in the New Testament, it can be found in places like 2 Corinthians chapter 8 or 9 or in the Old Testament in the book of Malachi. I'm not going to read either of them now. We have other matters to attend to in what I think the primary message here in this passage is, but I will cover those issues in details when we get to the letter of Corinthians and the other books one day soon. But let me tell you this. The essence of those chapters, particularly those within the New Testament context, tell us that we should not give out of any sense of legalism and certainly not of, not out of grudging obligation. But rather, as described in Corinthians, we should give 
in three ways. And as I said, those three ways we should approach giving should be cheerfully. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Generously. And indeed, this added most important aspect of sacrificially. When we get to those mass, those other passages, we will see that when Paul talks about giving, he actually sets up the whole discussion about setting aside money by talking about the setting aside of money for the poor saints to support the poor saints in Jerusalem. He then speaks highly of as an example of a church in Macedonia, but what he praises them for is their generosity in spite of their poverty. He's not talking about the amount, he's talking about the fact that they're giving out of their poverty. They're giving beyond their ability, and he says they're also giving willingly, willingly and eagerly. So Paul also commends people for giving with that perspective. They gave of themselves first to the Lord, and then to others. And they did all that according to the will of God, he says. And that, I believe, encapsulates the New Testament perspective on giving. You start first by giving yourself wholly to the Lord. And if you haven't done that, then pretty much everything I say about this isn't going to mean anything to you and won't have an impact on you. The essence of what God really wants and what Jesus illustrates here is that she gave herself to the Lord and even that was represented physically, literally here, with her giving financially beyond, in a sense, her ability to give. She gave more than what she had the ability to do so, which is exactly what Jesus wants to illustrate here with this widow described in this passage. So the issue is not the amount of the offering, but rather it is about the priorities on what you choose to spend your money on during the week or the, amount, or the month and the amount left over at the end of the month that you choose to give to the Lord. God doesn't look so much at the amount in the offering. He looks at what you're doing with your financial resources in your entire life and what you have left over and you decide to leave over after you've given to the Lord's work. And by this, he assesses whether or not you're giving according to your ability, generously, sacrificially. So what that means is that what might seem trivial to one person could be a significant sacrificial sum to another. And importantly, the no Lord knows which it is. Sometimes the gift of a rich person doesn't really cost them very much. However, the two small coins of the widow illustrated here was everything she had at that point in time. She gave with almost reckless generosity by giving, the key thing is, all that she had left. So when it comes to giving, God does not see the portion given, but sees the proportion, but holds that alongside the condition of the heart. For some people, I believe the principle of tithing is quite impossible until they get their finances in order. But others, it might be where they should start, not stop. But we're not meant to be legalistic about it. We are New Covenant, New Testament believers. I've heard that great speaker, Dr. Charles Ryrie, suggest that wealth should simply mean that we are able to give more, demonstrating all the more that we're not bound by the Mosaic law and we are free to give with absolute generosity of spirit. Now, as an ex-financial advisor, a long time ago in my past, granted, I left that industry in around 1999-2000, I had a, a number of clients, people who advised, who were Christian people, and I've seen believers who got, got themselves into debts, many of them before they came to faith, but sadly still some after they became Christians. They found themselves in deep, deep debt and unable to afford to give a, work, a lot to the work of the Lord. Now, in such cases, I would start by recommending that you give what you can afford, even if it might be a smaller amount, and you give that amount regularly, as long as the small amount you're giving still represents a sacrifice, and then gradually increase the amount as you pay off the debts. Now, sacrifice, I believe, should not include essential like mortgage payments, rent or food. I don't think the Lord asks anybody to forego those things to help support a local church or a local ministry. But there are areas in all our lives where I believe we can redirect resources to the Lord's work. And that is the point. It is those decisions that represent the sacrifice 
in modern terms in our thinking today. Now, for instance, for some people who are w wishing to realign their priorities, so to speak, it can me make a decision to dine out less, to be involved in paying for entertainment or expensive subscriptions for luxury services, or it could just be as simple as deciding to have one less $5, five pound cup of coffee per week. The principle, the underlying principle is that God delights in the cheerful and joyful giver. And the principle is also taught by Jesus when he said, for it is more blessed to give than receive. And if you hold that perspective, it suggests there might be a time for you to renew your mind through repentance, which simply means changing the way you do things in the future because of the revelation of knowledge that God has given you. And in the practicalities of this situation, God may be pointing out to you how at the moment what you're doing or even perhaps what you're spending your money on is not entirely aligned with his will. And our response to that should simply be to align our thinking with God's perspective and the wallet will follow. One more observation. What struck me about this passage in Luke when I read it is how Jesus looked at this situation and knew exactly what she'd given, two mites. And the answer is, of course, he was able to do this simply because he is who he is, the Son of God. But I think the point of understanding that is to know that he knows the amount she gave. He also knew the proportion she gave in terms of her income. And he also knew that it was a sacrificial giving. And there's no way a human observer looking at that simple situation could have known any of that additional background information. How would an, an ordinary observer know she only had two mites left? I'm struck by the fact that the Lord not only knows the amount, but he knows the attitude and he knows whether it's sacrificial or not. And in some cases, he thinks absolutely that someone giving five dollars, five pounds is much more sacrificial than someone else giving 20 or 100. John Roberts was a very famous 19th century Baptist preacher and he did something one Sunday morning which I'm sure most of us would not be brave enough to do. As he was about to receive the offering it's reported he stepped down from the pulpit just on one Sunday and one occasion and he stood beside one of the ushers. Then as the ushers moved down the aisle and uh, passed the plate he followed one of them and he watched intently what everyone put in the plate. Can you imagine a pastor doing that today? I'm not recommending it, but you can imagine, I'm sure even then, some people were understandably, I would say, angry. Some felt ashamed. Most were just surprised, you might say, shell-shocked that he'd done that. Anyway, that's what he did. The offering was brought to the front, and he simply returned to his pulpit and began his sermon. And he preached on the widow who gave two mites. But let me conclude by telling you how he concluded his sermon that day. He said, if you take it to heart that I can see the offering you made today, remember the Lord goes down the aisle every Sunday and he knows more in that he knows not only the content of the offering plate, the content of your bank accounts, even more than that, he knows the content of your heart. And he sees and is grateful for every sacrifice, whether it be monetary, or otherwise, because it is through those sacrifices that people make and build the kingdom of God. I'll leave it there for today. Thanks for being with me. just like to remind you that every single episode I make available on the Bible Project Daily Podcast, the main thing, is free, freely available, shared freely in the public domain for you to use it or its resources in whatever way helps you build the kingdom in the place that God has placed you. 
the additional free resources of the episode notes page and the transcript of others say are copyright free as well for you to take and use in whatever way you find helpful. If you'd like to reach out and connect with me, there's social media links as well as places like Patreon available. If you're not seeing them on the place you get your podcasts from, then have a look where it's hosted at the Bible Project at Buzzsprout.com. And with that all said, I'll leave it there for today. Thanks for being with me, and I do hope I'll see you back here again very soon on the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Bye-bye for now.